Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Revit Template Creation Part 1. Um, we've got about 105 attendees for this, so I'm just going to start this off early because we have a lot to cover. Um, as I said before, let's all leave questions till the end of the webinar. And um, also, this is part one of a part two series on Revit templates. And I believe the, the next uh, portion of the series will be covered uh, next Tuesday. Um, so with that said, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me and can see my screen. Uh, and I will begin. Uh, so like I said, Revit template creation part one. Uh, I'd just like to talk a little bit about who Microdesk is and what we do. Uh, we're an ACO uh, consulting firm. We deal mostly with uh, BIM, uh, asset management, and many other variations of training. Um, we have about 13 locations. We're on an 8 to 8 time clock, so we can serve all different areas. Um, and there's about 170 ACO consulting specialists and software developers on our team. A lot of PhDs on this side and a lot of um, architecture licenses and many other specialized uh, different um, titles. Uh, we are a platinum partner and we're an IBM business partner. So now I'd just like to talk a little bit about what we do. Uh, we offer building information modeling. This is mostly uh, the consulting end of our business. We also offer uh, enterprise strategy and workflow assessment. This is where we come in and sort of give you an idea of how you're functioning, where you could improve, and where um, you can create automation and efficiency. Uh, and we also do uh, technology management and mentoring, which is what we're doing today in this webinar. Um, and inside of enterprise strategy and workflow assessments, we have application development where we can, you know, help you build the plugin that you need to, you know, automate your workflow. Uh, so a little bit about me today. Um, my name is Jerji uh, Shkurti. Um, I am an architectural consultant. As you can see in the left-hand side uh, image, this is me sort of writing the, the BIM processes sort of hill. Uh, I do deal in, in business intelligence and analytics. I have helped create standards, content creation, and workflows. I've been working in the AACO for about 10 years, and I am software agnostic. Uh, what are we talking about today? The webinar agenda is going to be about the Revit template. So why should we de develop a Revit template? Um, what is a start page on a Revit template? How does browser organization help us um, achieve success and organize our teams? How do view templates help us um, place views correctly? What are filters? What is the project information? Um, how legends can help inform how the template works? And then finally, sheets. As I said before, um, this is part of a two-series webinar, so if I don't get to some of the latter topics, they will be covered in the next webinar. Uh, so why? Uh, there are many reasons to create a Revit template. I personally believe that it's um, a very smart way to onboard your staff and to create um, a good environment for standards and help the software lead your team to the desired uh, results. So it reduces redundancy. It cuts hours of prep by doing it once and having it automate a lot of um, other sort of minuscule and redundant tasks. It increases automation. Um, and it does educate and guide project teams. And it also helps educate and um, inform new hires that might not know the software so well. Um, it does establish rules to complement how Revit works. And it applies innovation rather than having to force it. Um, this last part, I think, is, is really important because there are times when you're on a deadline and you need to complete something. And instead of, you know, 
completing it, you have to sort of figure out how to tinker with Revit in order to make it work. This can be done in advance in a Revit template so that you're not, you know, stuck at a crucial point. Um, and lastly, I think this will help you position yourself in the industry. Um, it will definitely, when I see templates from different trades, I can tell who has set themselves up to succeed and has set themselves up in an organized fashion so that they can actually collaborate rather than be in an insular environment where they're just strictly working inside of their models and then sharing them. Um, just a little bit about what's coming next. There's a Revit Template 2, uh, which will be the next webinar, um, and then Revit Template 3 possibly coming up on an advanced template creation for automation, and then we'll have some Rhino 6 graphics in our future um, webinars. Uh, like I said, let's refrain on questions till the end of this, and um, if you guys want to follow me by launching Revit, now would be the right time to do it. If not, you can still follow this webinar by just um, having me uh, guide you through in my Revit model. So I'm just going to I'm going to sort of zoom in here into my Revit model that I have, and this is my template. Um, and I'm basically going to let everyone sort of launch their Revit, uh, give a little bit of time there uh, so people can catch up with me. Um, and as we see here, this is a basic start page that I have set up. Um, and we're going to go from this point, we're going to move over to the right-hand side over here to my browser organization. We're going to talk a lot about this. I think this is one of the primary things that you need to do before you move into um, the actual view templates, which will be on my left side or in my view um, options, and I can manage those view templates. So um, I would assume that everyone has Revit launched at this point who's going to follow me in this. But something that I, I normally see when, when I go to offices is that uh, no one has a really uh, well thought out start page. And start pages are almost like the most distilled version of a BIM execution plan. So if you don't have a BIM execution plan, the start page will, will definitely uh, save you some, some troubles on the legal end and also will help inform the people you're working with on how you're using the software and what your project is named. Um, so something that you normally see is that you'll have an image inserted of the project as like a boilerplate kind of rendering. And then below it, you'll have something that uh, expresses a disclaimer. Usually you'll find this on the AIA website. It's like a boilerplate sort of um, exempting you from taking uh, liability in how the model is shared. If the model is being shared as an as-built, then that would be uh, sort of put into this boilerplate. If the model is being um, uh, used for class detection, then you would also see that information here. Alternatively, on the other side here, I have the information. So usually there'll be a company logo, um, address, and then there's always something really big and big red letters to check work sets because if we're working in collaboration, we definitely want to have work sets set up. Um, and then project name, model name, and if we move further down, this is super important, I would say, is um, you want to express when it was created, who created it, and what version and build of Revit you're working in. because um, if you're working on a large-scale project, if all teams don't know what version of Revit they're on, then that could cause major, major problems in terms of corruption of models. Um, on the right-hand side here, you've got the team, so director, project manager, and some offices might have these two roles sort of lumped in, but you definitely need someone to be a BIM coordinator, and that would be likely the person who's setting up this template for you. Uh, and then in the end, you'd have the team members that are doing the actual production. Um, so that is um, a little bit about the start page. I recommend that everyone has a start page set up and you can put as much information as you need. I've seen start pages that are very long. I like to make a rule that it should be as simple as possible and the information could be read in a good minute or two. Um, and if you want to know how to set up a start page, all you have to do is go to um, your Manage tab, and there's a little button here that, you know, 
you can specify what your start page is, right? So I have this uh, with the underscore start page, and I'll explain why later and why it's uh, lowercase. Um, so now that we've talked about the start page, let's move on to browser organization. And I see this a lot um, where browser organization um, is tends to, to be uh, sloppily arranged uh, in the sense that you just have working and then those working views get placed on a sheet set and that's that, right? But you can really do some, some good, good automation by having your browser tell you what to do just uh, by organizing it, naming it appropriately and uh, setting it up so that it can succeed once you get to your sheets and also it can succeed in terms of how you filter your views. So first thing that uh, I would like to talk about is if you right click on browser organization, you'll see that you have the option to edit it. Um, and what you can do here is you can um, either set up the way that you wanted it to be um, laid out. So as you can see on my right hand side here, I've got working, presentation, and documentation. So my working views I usually set up as views that are um, sort of a little bit more sloppy. They, uh, you can do uh, a lot more production in them and uh, every member can sort of learn how to work inside of Revit. The presentation views are way more controlled where they actually output something that's of a graphic aesthetic for the company you work in and that gets sort of presented during the, the concept and schematic design phases. And then finally, you've got documentation, which is where uh, you're taking your uh, DD and CD drawings and placing them on sheets. Now, all of this, uh, the full model obviously is incorporated in all three of these uh, different browser categories. However, each one shows the model differently. Um, so as I look here in my browser organization, I'd just like to talk a little bit about how I've set up this browser. So if I go to edit my views, you can see that, um, first off, I'm already filtering something out um, in my views. So there's two types of browsers that I have. I have a documentation, which is my general overall. And since this is an interior design template, I've also created um, a hidden browser for the model room, which will be a separate model later on. So I'm not showing that now because the model room is not expected at this portion, uh, or let's say this was the start of the project. Also, you can see that the browser category has two very distinct groups, right? It's grouped by, by browser category, which is the name, 01 working, 02 presentation, or 04 documentation. The reason I have this set up this way is so that it can be in sequential order. Um, and then also by the view template. So what's really nice is that when I create a view, the view template will automatically place it in the right location depending on what kind of view it is. And this does save a lot of time once you've had your view template set up. Um, alternatively, inside of um, the browser organization properties, there's also how you set up the sheets. And so in the same way that I've got my view set up, I've also set up my sheets where I've got documentation and this is my other way that I can show my model room uh, sheets if I wanted to. But for now, let's just take a look at documentation. And the way that um, I also have a filter here for this. And if I once I go back, I'll show you the filter I have for the model room. But if I go to grouping and sorting, I've got a sheet category and a sheet subcategory. And these two options help me place my sheet in the right location. If anyone knows who's created a sheet, sheets usually come in with the, the triple um, question mark. And what that tells you is that it hasn't been placed in the right sheet category and the right sheet subcategory. And so this helps control that. So when this is set up correctly, it streamlines the process of placing views and creating sheets. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what views look like and then I'm going to move into legends and then eventually I am going to run down to the sheets. Um, okay, so first off I'd like to um, open up my working views. And the way that I've set up my working views is based by view template as I said before. So for example, 
um, as you can see here, each one of these working views has been named appropriately. Uh, you have to imagine that these are all just sort of start points where if you wanted to own this view specifically, you'd put your initials and that would be like your view that you could do anything to because it's a working view. Um, and WK obviously is my naming convention. This is something I came up with for this template. So working, L for elevation, exterior, and then east. Why do I do this? Because when I am placing these views on a sheet, I want to know exactly what kind of view I'm placing on that sheet. So it definitely helps me organize myself so that I'm not wasting time looking for the right view. And something else I'd like to explain, and this is common industry knowledge, but not known by all, um, is that if a, a view is lowercase, um, at least in this template, and I have rules for this, um, it should not go on a sheet. So when you do onboarding or training with someone, you can explain to them that if it's lowercase, this is a view strictly used for production and modeling. You do not place this view on a sheet. Whereas if I go to my presentation views, you can see here that they're capitalized, and that's already like a signal to say that this view can go on a sheet. Um, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about how my presentation, documentation, and um, working are all sort of helping build this model. Um, as I said, uh, all of these are set up so that when you have this view here, you know exactly which sheet to place it on. So I've got 100 FP floor plans, right, and then enlarged floor plans for this template. So I'm going to enter really quickly into uh, my working uh, FP level one. And you can see here that I've got a lot of stuff going on. And so I left this view purposefully kind of dirty to show you guys how a view template can affect what's going on with that view. So in this view, I personally would only like to see my working um, interior elevations and my working sections. Um, instead, I'm seeing a whole lot of other stuff, um, and I can explain how this uh, came to be. So inside this view template, uh, which I've used to place this view here, so let me just explain what view templates quickly do for us. Um, if I were to just, for fun, uh, create a, a new uh, plan view, um, I'm going to make that a floor plan. Notice how up here I've got my different types of floor plans that I can create. So I've got my documentation floor plans and then I've got my working floor plans. If I'm using a working floor plan, um, it will automatically, uh, obviously I have created all of them, so let me just duplicate one. I'll duplicate the level one floor plan. Uh, and I'll automatically place it in that location. Um, the only thing that I would have have to do is just rename it appropriately. So let's call this working FP level one. Uh, and then I'm just going to put my initials in here so people know that it's mine. And I do not want to name the corresponding views. Um, so that was that was quite quick, right? It knows exactly where to go and the view template have, helps support it. But something else that the view template can do for me is um, it can help with my filters. So the next thing that I like to do when I'm setting up a Revit template is I like to think about what things I'm going to filter out of each different view type. Uh, so if I go up here under my view and I go into filters, you can see that for this template I've made some very simple filters, right? Uh, and something I would like to explain here is that Revit, at least I'm using version 2017, uh, I, I do believe in 2019 you do have an OR instead of an AND here, or you can specify AND or OR. But I am filtering out all the different types of uh, callouts, elevations, and sections, right? Because in my working views, I only really want to see my working um, elevations and sections. In my documentation, I only want to see my documentation information. So there's a different tag for each different view. And this quickly helps me filter that out in my view template. Um, and I'm doing it by family and type. So that floor plan was a family and type, right? And um, also an elevation will be a family and type. And you can see here that, for example, for presentations, I'm filtering my elevation presentations. And so I'll show you how this actually works inside of the template. 
Now this definitely saves a lot of time and it helps clean out your drawings so that you're not sitting there having to turn things on and off. It does it sort of on a global level. Um, so let me go to my um, working floor plan and show you how you can apply these filters. So right now I have all my filters turned off. If I wanted to, oh, sorry, turned on. If I wanted to turn them off, I would just go here. And then also another thing I'd like to talk about, this is going to be sort of like a mixed presentation. I'm obviously talking about the browser organization here, but as you can see, I've gotten into my view templates because the two just work together. And as you can see in my working uh, FP floor plan view template, I've done something very interesting, which is I've chose to exclude all of these options. And um, we can get into that once I stop speaking about filters, but by excluding those options, I'm basically saying that that view, um, whoever opens that view can make changes only to that view by going to the visibility graphics rather than globally. If I had this checked, any view that had a working FP floor plan view template would change with it. Um, so that's just a quick aside. We'll come back to that later. But now I would like to show you how filters work because it's the next big thing that you need to set up once your views and browser organization is set up. So, I mean, filters can range and range. They can go for this presentation, I've only used it to uh, hide uh, elevations, sections, and callouts. So since this is a working view, I'm going to hide all my presentation elevations, all my model rooms, and all my documentation, right? And so what that does when I apply it is that it cleans up my view to only show um, just my, my working um, tags which is very lovely, and then those correspond to um, a working uh, elevation, interior elevation over here. And alternatively, let me just uh, pop into uh, like a presentation floor plan and show you guys what that would look like. So for the presentation floor plan, I've made sure that the my elevation tags show up red, right? And as you can see here, if I go into my um, PR floor plans and my filters, I've set up my presentations to show up red. Why did I do this? Because I wanted to scream out at you that you shouldn't really print this and eventually you should turn it off because we don't really include annotations in most presentation drawings that we, um, we submit. I mean, that depends on your office, obviously. Um, and then finally, if I move on to my, uh, my documentation uh, floor plans, you can see that this looks slightly different. First of all, my tag here is a different kind of tag, and my callout detail is different. They're both black, and they're both going to end up on a sheet. That's why um, those filters really help me. If I didn't have the filters, I would get really confused in terms of what kind of tag I was selecting. Um, so those are two fundamental uh, just things that you want to do out of the box. Uh, and some of this browser organization, I'd like to speak a little bit to that. Um, I didn't build this all just by like thinking about it one day. I've looked at a lot of view templates and I've decided to take the better parts of those different office view templates and include them in this one. So that's one way to think about view templates is to, you know, you're obviously collaborating with different trades. Look at other view templates, see what they're doing well, how they're automating their processes, and see how you can incorporate that into your office. Um, so two schools of thought on view templates, just as another quick aside, is that some offices like to say that your view template should be specific to the project. Other offices like it to be uh, standardized to the office. I think the, the latter approach actually has more beneficial rewards in that everyone is working in a similar environment and you don't have to do a lot of digging to solve problems. Um, so now that we've talked a little bit about how um, the browser organization and the view templates work, let's just take another look at like something that view templates can quickly just do for us so that we're not, you know, sitting there manipulating uh, what we want our drawing to look like. Something that I always like to profess uh, on the BIM coordinator side is that um, if you, if these are capitalized and the view templates have been set up in that template, uh, 
you shouldn't really touch them. View templates are sacred. So anything, so for example, let's go to um, a 3D isometric, which looks like this. So this has a view template very simply set up. And if I go to this isometric, you'll see that I've chose to disclude the scale, so that scale can be changed uh, analog for that view. And I've chose to include all these other options. So now, if someone were to go in here and tamper with how this looks, not only would they change this view, they would change all views that this view template is applied to. Um, so that's, that's something to be very careful with, because then you're changing how, um, how standardized your drawings are going to look. Uh, and then something else, so for, for this example, I'd just like to show that if we're just talking about very simple model overrides, for example, I've decided to, um, for my, my furniture, I've decided to change, first off, just to make this look a certain way, I've basically selected all and I've changed all my patterns for this view to be uh, like a gray color. Basically, I'm trying to create a monochrome style uh, rendering output for presentation. And so here I've basically changed the color. So every pattern and surface in this view that this view template is applied to will be gray. And um, every uh, piece of furniture will be transparent. Um, so that, you know, the, the building itself bumps out and then the furniture is sort of like, like background uh, setting. And this is something that, you know, someone would have to spend time uh, fixing or setting up if they didn't have it pre-baked into the template. So now we know that all of our 3D isometrics are going to look the same. They're going to have the same graphic um, integrity and all my furniture is going to be transparent. So that's just something really quick that you can build into uh, a template. Um, alternatively, uh, if I go into my like shadow settings, I've got both um, ambient shadows and I'm casting shadows. And then I've chose to, for example, set my lighting up so that it's like at three, very light, and then my sun is set. So that means that each, each level of gray in this template or that this template is used on will show up the same. Uh, those little things, you know, are a couple of clicks, right? But if you um, multiply those clicks, those minutes turn into hours. So that's what we're trying to reduce here. Okay, so now I am going to further continue and talk a little bit about um, how we set up uh, our documentation. And so our documentation, obviously, if I go to like a finished plan here, um, I've got this set up. So anytime that I create, let's say I wanted to create a new documentation floor plan. I'm going to go to hit floor plan, and then I can automatically just pick one of these and let's say I wanted to do this finish plan level two, hit OK. It's automatically going to end up there. And so let's say this is, um, just let's name it correctly. Now, as you guys can see here, I haven't done something like 200 FP finish plan. The reason I'm doing this in terms of the naming convention is because when I place it on a sheet, I don't want that to be the name on my view title. So I'm just going to call this finish plan level two. No, I will not like to do that. Okay, so um, now that I've, I've shown you guys how that works, and that basically works for every different type. So if I were to create, um, let's say, an elevation, I've got my elevation set up so that they end up in the right browser category through my family. So I've got one for you know my documentation, one for my presentation, and then I've got two for my working. Um, Let's continue uh, and talk a little bit, let's just go down the line, about legends. So um, does everyone, I'm, I'm assuming everyone knows that when you're doing legends, you're placing multiple forms of information. So the difference between a legend and like a drafting view is that you can only place one thing on a drafting view and um, give it a number to place on a sheet, whereas with the legend, you can put uh, large amounts of information. For example, if uh, I was doing, for example, door styles, I've got my door styles set up here uh, with families ready to go, and people have something of a base to work off of, and they'll just plug in their own doors using um, component uh, legend components. 
Uh, and so these kind of things really help save a bunch of time and just simple families like this uh, help just you can go in there plug and play sort of insert the information as you can see it on the side uh, this is one way to use legends uh, to to their efficiency and to project automation another way that I like to use legends is that all the things that I'm saying to you guys in this uh, webinar should be contained inside of the Revit project itself. So if you are a new user who is coming in and wants to uh, learn about the project, then uh, you can just simply go to the legend and say, hey, um, you know, what do I do with my view and sheet naming convention? And in those legends, you can specify how you would like to name your sheets. Or for example, what do my line weights look like at uh, 1 to 50 scale? Uh, you can put that in the legend so you have a better idea of how things look or what are my keyboard shortcuts um, and so on and so forth right and I like to do this so I've also created a hierarchy here where anything lowercase is basically to inform the user on how to use the template anything uppercase is set up so that um, you can place that on a sheet um, okay then I realize we only have about nine minutes so I'm going to save the last five minutes for questions, but I quickly want to touch a little bit on um, sheets. So as you can see here, I've got my presentation, my documentation, and my sketches set up. Um, some people don't put sketches in here. Uh, they still do them by hand. I think they're important. Um, but for example, my, my naming convention here is pretty simple. It's basically um, based on sequence. So one, two, three, four, five for presentation. Uh, and then this is also based on sequence, you know, 0 to 800. Um, so let's just quickly talk about, for example, placing an overall plan in this empty elevation. Sorry, in this empty title block. Um, if I wanted to go add view, this is what I'm talking about with my browser uh, naming. I can quickly go to, let's say, uh, I know that it's a 100 floor plan and I would need to find that 100 floor plan. Um, so anything that's uppercase, I can quickly go to it. And then um, I guess I don't have any overalls, so I'm going to just go for an enlarged floor plan, and I'm going to add that view to sheet. Uh, and then as you can see, I quickly know what to look for when I'm adding it to this sheet. Let me see if I can uh, do a standard. Looks like my view titles are not working for this, but we'll fix that for the next one. But the one thing that I want to talk about with how this sheet is placed or created. So when everyone creates a new sheet, um, you can quickly go and pick your title block, right? So this is something else that you want to have pre-built into the template. That will be covered in the uh, second portion of this webinar. But um, once that sheet is created, let's say I wanted to use um, A0 title block, um, and I wanted to, for example, make sure that that sheet goes in the right location. Right now, it doesn't have anywhere to be placed, but as soon as I cha change these, these two options, it will automatically, so let's say this is uh, you know, an overall plan, and the sheet category is obviously documentation. It's going to automatically go to that location for me. So those two little things, the sheet subcategory, help me, you know, organize my template. And you can further automate this where you can also, you know, make sure that the name uh, from the previous name repeats, and then you can place it on that sheet. Um, looks like we're coming to that five-minute mark, so I can continue going further, or we can open it up to questions. Uh, let me um, open up my little little browser and let's uh, let's open this up to question. Like I said, there's more and more information that I will need to cover in the second portion of this webinar. This is more like uh, breaking of the ice and showing you just basic browser organization, how filters work, and how view templates can help control your views and place them in the right location. Um, so yeah. Uh, if you feel free to ask, uh, oh, I think I see some questions. Uh, one second. 
I've got tons of questions. Too much info to digest in one go, hence um, require a recording otherwise pretty conversant with what is being demo. Uh, yes, this is true. I mean, I was trying to sort of, the, the beautiful thing about templates that I, I would like to say is that once you have all this information compact in one, you can just quickly share it between the different uh, styles of, um, of project that you're doing, and you can mix and match. Um, let me see if I can make this just slightly bigger. There we go. Awesome. Um, uh, is there a way to copy a sheet with views in place and any other elements that we have set up on the first one? Yes, I mean, that's, that's an easy one to do where you would just uh, right click on it. Um, actually, if we're talking about the, the only problem about sheets is that you can't duplicate sheets. I believe the question you're trying to ask is, you know, can I duplicate sheets the same way that I would duplicate views? Uh, which you can't. You have to create a sheet and then you can use something to line them up. Uh, for example, I like to use plugins like Arc Smarter to line up my views in the same exact location. Uh, I believe there is going to be a recording posted for this webinar. We are recording this live. How did I create the start sheet? Um, that is a good question. Uh, let me go back to the start sheet. So if I go back to my start page, this information uh, is basically placed on a legend. I just went to a new legend. Um, I picked a, a scale for this and uh, it comes in blank and then basically all of this is text. And so you can just come in there and you know retype the information that you need uh, appropriately to your project. Let me find an interesting question. Let's see what we got here. Um, yeah, I can make this file available um, to everyone. I just have to strip it out of certain things, but for sure I can uh, I can sort of make it very simple to like the kind of topics that we covered just in this webinar. Yes, the guide grid definitely comes in handy. Um, also, one thing to note about creating sheets is that if you create a new sheet, it always goes to zero, zero, versus if you copy and paste a title block on another sheet, you kind of lose that zero, zero point unless you say place to that, that same origin. Can you create a template from an, from existing views and sheets from Tom? Um, so as everyone knows, right, uh, usually what you can do is if someone, let's say an architect send you, sent you their template, but you don't want to completely start with everything in their template, like maybe you want to incorporate the title block, maybe you want to incorporate just some of like the browser organization, there's a little button over here uh, that's called transfer project standards um, and usually what you have to do is I'm just going to create a new project just use a, a default um, template here so does everyone see what I just did usually where this template would live would be when you create new project you would clean out all that information in your options um, under the file locations, right? So right now I've got this template that I'm pointing to, but I could I could add a new one and basically point whatever template I want to it. Like let's say I want this default template and that's where my template would live, right? So this basically saves you the trouble of having to look for it and it just opens it up automatically. So let's say I wanted to use just a basic default template from Autodesk um, and I wanted to transfer some information. So I'm going to say new project. Uh, 
Uh, just a, another note, uh, our webinar recordings do get emailed and pushed on, a, on an on-demand user basis. Uh, it's on our website and it should be available within 24 hours. So for those that got in late, for those that missed it, for those that want to you know, take their time sort of digesting this, this will be available for you guys. Um, to Tom's question, I'm just going to open up a quick empty file here. And let's say I want to transfer some of the project standards from my template for this webinar. I can go into Manage, Transfer Project Standards. And here you have the opportunity to, um, you know, share families, share uh, browser organizations. So let's say I'm going to check None, and I'm going to quickly just go to Browser Organization. And then I'm going to uh, scroll down, and maybe I want to say View Templates. Those are the only two things I want to transfer. Uh, and I could also um, view reference types would be really important. Um, and then if you're doing families, uh, you're going to have to find the, I believe, title blocks you have to do manually. So that's the one thing that's not going to work. So if I hit all those three, you'll see I'll just hit OK. And um, I've transferred that information in here. So if I go to browser organization, you can see that I can set this up to browser group documentation and that information has transferred over. Obviously, the way that this was created, those, um, those views don't have a browser group associated to them. Hence, I don't have any views set up. Um, the other thing that I'd like to, to go back to is that when you have information like this set up, it really helps inform, like, okay, how do I name my overall plans? I quickly can go in there, and I know exactly how the next one should look. So um, as you're sort of navigating through the Revit interface, you quickly can just, you know, go to where you need to go and have that open. And you, you can also, you know, let's say you're early in the project, you can filter things out that you might not want to see. Like in Sheets, for example, you can filter out Sheets through your browser organization by, um, you know, DD standards, for example. So that would be more of like an advanced topic of how to use the, the template. But let me go back to the questions. Um, let's see. Uh, any processes to run quick quality check with so many standards to go through? I, this is a great question. Um, I think the best way to do that is just to build a very simple room and start testing out um, how it looks in every different template. Um, I personally, if I'm building a Revit template, now something about a Revit template that everyone should know, you can do one really quick in two weeks to like, you know, uh, get yourself started, but it's it's an organic thing that grows with your office. So it can take anywhere from two weeks to six months. The the last template that I've been working on has been almost a six month job, and it's still continuing to evolve. Um, so quality checks with standards. Just to get back to the question, two things I always like to look at is, um, for example, one of them is how their families are named. Like in my case, I've Let's just look at the annotation families, which we'll talk about in the next um, in the next at webinar. I try to make sure that things are labeled correctly. So usually I have an XX here. Usually this will be the company uh, initials, so that I know which family and what it does. Uh, do they have a really good sort of explanation of how the template works? So in my case here, I've tried to make sure that I cover all my bases where like I explained to you, this is how my project browser is going to be um, set up. This is how my naming convention is going to be set up. And I've specifically decided to cut these into little uh, small pieces of information because they're easier to digest rather than put them in one gigantic sort of like matrix and have you sort of trying to find out what you're looking for. Um, Another thing that you can definitely tell when people are working correctly with their templates is that they know exactly how their work sets should be named. So work sets is a very important one. So this is a legend that I just start and I set up for teams where I was like, please name your work set accordingly. Like you should have these work sets already pre-built into your model. And this is how you should name your links. Um, and like I said, lots of this information is already uh, included in a BIM execution plan, but as 
most of us have found out sometimes you don't get a BIM execution plan. Sometimes the client doesn't request one. Sometimes the architect doesn't write one or vice versa. Um, so I always like to say that, you know, inside the model there should be something informing you of how to go about building. Um, other quality checks uh, to that question is you can see when it's over-engineered and way too complicated. For example, if you've got filters on top of filters on top of filters, you're definitely not going to know what you're doing when, when you're opening it. So um, there should be some kind of onboarding and there should also be uh, keep it as simple as possible with what you're doing so that it should just be able to explain itself. Um, let me go back. I think I have, it's uh, 1.45, but I might be able to do one more question. Um, let's see. Uh, um, yeah, it looks like we're, we're all sort of tapping out on this, but uh, I appreciate everybody's time. Um, and like I said, this should be available to you guys within a 24-hour period. Um, and there's definitely a lot of information here to grab into uh, in 45 minutes. However, um, I think once you get started in the thinking process of creating something like this, then you de definitely streamline how your staff uh, adapts with the software. Uh, and then you also do those little innovations early in advance rather than having to do them when you're in you know crunch time on a project um, so thank you very much guys uh, we'll have a yeah sure I can definitely cover work sets and work sharing that's a definitely definitely a big big uh, item to cover um, I that might be a, a third webinar on Revit templates or something just on its own specifically. But yeah, that's a great question. Um, all right, guys. Thank you so much.